I worked for a uh, company for 23 years. After radio, I worked for this trade publication. And we put out 100 page newspaper every week. It was ink on your hands, stuff, and it was the news of the business. And I remember when I was on radio and it would come in, we'd rip it open and pour through it because it was, it, it was all the news about the radio and record business, the artists and the charts and all this stuff. And um, <coughs> when Billboard Magazine bought us in 06, I worked for them for about two weeks and realized that, that wasn't going to work. So I started my own company with my couple of people that worked with me. Even, even in you guys' lifetime, think of just the last five years, there wasn't Pandora. There wasn't Facebook. And now there are more Facebook users than there are people in the United States. So it's so it's just this it's just this adaptability and, and you know all, what you're really doing here is learning how to learn uh, to me above everything and, and figuring out that how to deal with change and that and the, you can't you're not going to have the answers so you can't be uncomfortable when something hits you you don't have the answer you just got to go figure it out we're talking that class earlier about it being the wild west on the internet and who owns what and creation and copyrights and who gets, how do you get paid for what you do and who should get paid and who should pay? We were talking about how content is king. Everybody wants content, whether it be Pandora or Facebook or whatever, but nobody wants to pay for it. So, and, but that's the way you grew up. And now it's extending past music to books, to movies, to everything. So, um, so just, I think, trying to, you know, and I, and I worked for other people for 45 years from the time I was a kid peddling ice cream on the south side of Chicago to working in this publication. Now all of a sudden, at the ripe old age of 56, you start your own business and trying, you know, trying to just figure that out as you're going and try to remember your accounting class when Homer Shoemaker said, debits are on the window side and credits are on the window side. You know, <laughs> the one business course I took, <laughs> which is probably why the Crimson Mass books were such a mess when I did them for a year. But um, um, one of our primary things we do every week is the chart. For the last 28 years, I put together the top 50 songs in America. When you hear most countdown shows, that's the one they're using. There's an intricate system in place in America for the last, I don't know, 60 years, and I'll give you a country as an example. There are 2,000 country radio stations in America, and I choose about 130 of them across America, and every week we take the music that they are playing and create a chart. In effect, the average program director of a radio station doesn't have the time to call another 129 guys and say, hey, what's hot? What's working? What are the hits? Hey, what's that new Luke Bryan record doing? How's it doing? So in effect, we do it for them. When we started our online thing, I mean, I couldn't figure out how to charge for news on the internet. News, not just our news, but I mean, news in general has become a commodity. It's one of the things that the internet has made free. So you can pay to get it free right now, or you can wait 10 minutes, or you can pay right now to get the news that we put out, or you can wait 10 minutes to get it for free. Well, everybody chooses free. So we, we had to figure out other ways to monetize what it is that we're doing. Um, it's, it's a lot like, you know, artists these days, singers, how they'll, it, record sales revenue used to be number one on the list, now it might be seven or eight because the music is just stolen on the internet through file sharing and other things. So they have to figure out, okay, we'll give away our music, or we're not gonna make any money on it, but how do we then make money from other things like ticket sales, t-shirts, whatever it happens to be. So we're in, in some ways the same, same way. We're, we, don't, we can't offset our expenses by uh, charging subscription rates so we, we do make, obviously, money on ads, our primary revenue, but we now have um, uh, tried to take our relationships we have with these radio stations in America's top 300 cities, and we've kind of spun off some other businesses trying to figure out how to make money with that. 
you know, Clear Channel has a couple of different programs, for instance, that you might hear. They'll, they have what they call Premium Choice, which is some of the best jocks in America, and they will just put a turnkey on a radio station. Or they have what they call point-to-point -point voice tracking, where somebody might be in a great talent in Minneapolis or Nashville or Washington or Baltimore, and they will um, take about 45 minutes to customize a four-hour radio show for that market. So you might be listening from 10 to 3, and the person you're listening to is actually coming from St. Louis or Milwaukee or wherever. Um, because technology has allowed them to be able to do that. And you can customize it to a degree with sports and weather or whatever you want to do. Um, and then the question becomes, if you had two radio stations, which is going to attract more listeners? A live and local with maybe lesser talent, but they are live and local or importing Ryan Seacrest from LA or all these other great talents, putting them on your station and making them sound like they're part of your community. But then who do you have to show up at the car dealer on Saturday at 10 a.m. for the night <laughs> So but so that's what radio is, you know, it's almost you wonder, are we heading towards the European style of radio where you have one piece of content? and 100 transmitters, and they all carry that, that content.